Intercom wants more of the nice people visiting your website to give you money. So they took that little chat bubble in the corner of a website and packed it with automatic meeting booking, data capture on leads, conversational bots, and more. Intercom user Elegant Themes added Intercom to their site and now convert 25% of leads through live chat. Go to intercom.com slash deals to jump on customer intent in the moment. Then see everything else Intercom can do. That's intercom.com slash deals. Hey, welcome back. It's time once again for another episode of Sales Pipeline Radio. As we grab our boards and swim out into the sea of sports that's swamping us everywhere here with the man who seems to watch them all. He has a 100 TVs set up right now. He watches football. He watches baseball. And, of course, of course, he watches probably the most amazing sport of all, the Apple Racing Contest in Juan River down in Tasmania. Yes, that's that time of year where they drop an apple and they watch it race down the river here. So I know that's near and dear to your heart. God bless the World Wide Web. <laughs> How long did it take you to find that? <laughs> find it. It's it's number one when you when you type uh, you know October sports every year in Tasmania they drop it off a bridge and then they let it flow down and whoever gets so far down the river the fastest wins. What a sport! So you assume that there's some strategy behind this, right? Like is it, <laughs> if you is it a bigger apple? Or if you like, if you can somehow figure out how do you hollow out the apple, that yes. means there it actually has less mass but can go faster Absolutely. through the currents. Like how there's there's must be some more. We got to do some more research on this. All I right. want to understand now. Apple race strategy. Someone, <laughs> someone has created that content. Well, hopefully they're not. There. You know, the, speaking speaking of. Uh, Hopefully they're not cooking, cooking it, you know, because that would change the dynamics totally here. You know, we don't want to cook the sport and, re- and fix the uh, results here. <laughs> uh, speaking of October sports, are we just not going to talk about the Dodgers at all? Are we just going to let that fly? <laughs> I think we're just going to let that slide. How could the Dodgers win more games than anybody else uh, be where they're at? Pushing hot buttons early and often here on Sales Pipeline Radio. Uh, well, thanks, everyone, for joining us. Until we went down the Apple race path, I was going to tell you that I think I, I'm in the wrong profession because the the news update that on, on the um, on the Funnel Media Radio Network. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. For those of you who are joining us live on the Funnel Media Radio Network, thank you for making us part of your workday. You may have heard the same story I did leading into our episode. That the that the creators of the song Christmas Time is here yes. right here on the on the on the um, the Peanuts Christmas special. They're upset because apparently it's being used by Dollywood. You can't make this story up. It's the Charlie Brown Christmas Dollywood. song has been used by Dollywood without paying royalties, and they want to. Uh, Charlie needs his money. The guy behind that wants his money. Whoever the guy is, right? Through, right yeah. Whoever the guy is, but did you hear how he wants for he wants one hundred and fifty thousand <laughs> yeah. dollars for each every time. time it's been played? Yeah, every for every ins played since two thousand seven. Yeah, I shouldn't have quit piano lessons. <laughs> I really should have kept up with that. I mean, I love my job and I love getting to do this. But yeah, yeah, right. man, that's that is something. Well, so if you didn't, <laughs> if you didn't listen to the live, or if you aren't listening to live, <laughs> if you're listening on the podcast, now you know we service. We 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 tell you about the most interesting sports in the world. We tell you what's happening in the world of uh, Southern California beach drizzle sports. And uh, <laughs> we're also here to talk about B2B sales and marketing. So if you're joining us in the podcast, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, our listenership continues to grow and you can find us anywhere. Fine podcasts are available. And every episode of Sales Pipeline Radio, we don't always go this deep into, uh, into uh, you know, eighth, eighth tier sports. But uh, we do talk a lot about sales and marketing. We're a couple, a couple hundred episodes in, so uh, if you want to catch up on what we've been doing, you can find every episode, past, present, and future on salespipelineradio.com. We are featuring some of the best and brightest minds in sales and marketing today. It's absolutely no different. I am really, really excited to have with us today Lindsay Peterson. She is a brand strategist. She is the author of the best-selling book, Forging an Ironclad Brand. Lindsay, thanks so much for joining us today. It's so good to be here with you. Thanks for having me. Should we talk about like so it, from a brand perspective? You know, I brought up this issue of the the Peanuts Christmas song and Dollywood. So you have a couple brands at play here, but more importantly, I think the idea that a song can be worth a hundred thousand, hundred fifty thousand dollars every time it's played. I mean, clearly there are probably some songs that might be even more iconic than that. But I mean, the impact of brand is everywhere, and my goodness, are there some multiples on the impact and value that can provide? It's crazy. It's so true. Yeah, I mean, the 
today, the most scarce resource that most of us have is attention. Any tool that can break through or can harness attention, whether it's a song or a brand name or an image, is, is truly a multiplier. Well, and I think especially when, you know, so we tend to talk a lot about B2B, and I think it's really easy for B2B companies, especially startups, to not prioritize brand because they're so focused on generating leads. They're so focused on getting pipeline and getting that next deal. And so the email next Tuesday becomes more important than creating some consistency, creating sort of a, a reputation for what you're doing. Um, you know, I know you've spent a lot of time, you spent, you know, years working on this. Your, your clients are kind of a who's who's list of, of companies around, around the world. Zoo Lily, Starbucks, T-Mobile, Coinstar. I mean, what do these companies recognize in value that startups are missing that need to be, that probably should be prioritizing earlier in their, in their maturity curve? Yeah. I mean, I think, so there's a couple of things and there's a distinction that's probably worth making that brand strategy is simply the definition of who you are, who you are, and what is the promise that you bring. So, what's the stake in the ground that you're putting? Why should why should uh, your customer uh, part with their hard-earned money or time or attention for you? So, it's it's really the definition of of the value that you bring. And brand marketing and the, the tactics for brand marketing and brand awareness building are those belong in kind of the bucket of marketing. And those, those are what can be kind of um, in conflict, some might say, with near term lead generation. Brand strategy does not, is, is agnostic of tactic. Um, just like your mission is agnostic of tactic. So, uh, related, but but distinct as well, right? So whether it's B two B or B two C, knowing the thing, being very precise about what is the value that you bring your customer um, is worthwhile, regardless of what kind of company you are, and regardless of what stage company you are. If you're a startup and you have a small marketing budget um, and a small innovation budget, uh, you probably stand to gain even more from focus, which is brand strategy is simply a tool for focus. So it's not less useful. It arguably is more useful um, as long as you're serving human beings who have uh, scarce attention. It's going to be really welcome to have a focus. So I love what you're saying. And just to reiterate, what you're saying is that I, I, having a brand as any stage company is not about having a brand budget. It's not about doing brand campaigns. It's really establishing who you are and being consistent to doing that. Like what, what are some of the things that when you talk to early stage companies about, about really establishing an ironclad brand, those things that they just need to make part of their culture and then create some discipline around, what are some of the foundational elements of doing that? To building a brand strategy? Yeah. I mean, cause I mean, I think, I think, there, I think sometimes I, I hear companies sometimes say, well, you know, we don't have time to invest in brand. We're spending that time and effort on generating demand, right? We have to focus on short term, you know, demand, you know, pipeline goals versus building our brand. And I think there's, there's sometimes I, I what I hear there is there's an association with between brand and I have to have money to do it. And I have to treat it as a campaign that's going to replace doing demand gen campaigns. And what I'm hearing from you is this is really more about the culture and discipline you have internally in terms of understanding who you are and how that's communicated to the market than it is yes. spending money or doing explicit campaigns. Yes, it has nothing to do with how much you spend. In fact, defining who you are doesn't cost anything. It costs you the time that you spend to do that defining. So you can have a brand strategy and spend zero on marketing, whether top of funnel or bottom of funnel. You can't, right, There's, they're, they're totally different variables. The thing about brand strategy and you know, the, the definition of your brand positioning is that it not only transcends tactic, marketing tactic, it transcends marketing. So in, you mentioned culture. Brand is a tool for distilling what's the culture that you want to bring. It's a tool for defining your product roadmap and your innovation pipeline. Uh, it's a tool to help you figure out how to price what you bring. So it's all of those things that the customer experiences, whether implicitly or explicitly, because that add up to what is the position of your your business and their brain. That's what your brand is. So it not only is bigger than 
how you allocate your budget, how you allocate your marketing budget, but it's bigger than everything. It's aligned with why does your company exist in the first place? So it's kind of a false, I mean, I might even say it's a cop-out to say, well, we're going to spend a lot of money on lead gen, so we don't need a brand. Those have nothing to do with each other. You can make your decision about what marketing tactics to invest in and not to invest in in a way that has nothing to do with your brand strategy. Probably are instances where it's wise to only invest in lead gen. You know, if you're not trying to create a long, enduring business, maybe that actually is in support of your business goals. And your brand strategy can help you to ensure that whatever message you're bringing in your lead gen is synergistic Mm -hmm. with something that only you can bring. They reinforce one another. It's not either or. It's, It's both and. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think that, you know, that is in some cases an uncomfortable answer question or answer for people that, you know, want to just say, I would just focus on building pipeline and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll earn the right to build a brand strategy and to have a brand after we get past this first hump. But everything you do, especially early on, like you're establishing who you are. Um, and, you know, having a sense and the, and look, I mean, as, as you well know, you talk about it in your book, I mean, brand, even ironclad brands can, can shift and, and change over time have to do that foundational work to be successful. And before we move on, I, I do want to talk a little bit about the book and some of the other resources that you have that I think are really important. We talk a little bit more explicitly about like, what's the opportunity cost of not doing this? Like what happens to companies if they're so focused on the next month, the next quarter, the email next Tuesday, if they're so focused on just whatever it takes, random acts of sales and marketing to get to the next, the next closest number, what happens to a business like that if they're not putting a focus on brand? Yeah, so the the adage is position or be positioned. If you are, you can either deliberately claim the position that's optimal for you, or you can let the market position you and hope that it will be an advantageous position. Most likely, you're going to have, you're going to arrive at a more value creating position if you're the one who determines what it's going to be. It's false to think that not doing this means you're not going to have a position. Of course you will. You will have a brand whether you overtly claim it and define it or whether you or, or, or not. And my argument is that it's so consequential to the future and the growth of your business and maybe even the, the value you create as a leader that it's, it's too important to leave it to uh, chance. So that on an existential level, that's how important it is. No, on a, like when it, when it comes to like really the exercise of defining your brand, if you don't do it at best, who'd be leaving money on the table because Mm -hmm. a brand that's differentiated and resonant with your customers commands pricing power. So at best, you're not making as big of an opportunity as you could be. At worst, you could be spending money, you know, whether you're raising venture capital or whether you're bootstrapping, you could be spending money against something that actually isn't that potent for uh, the person who's making the purchase decision. And this is all be- because it's of sort of a false understanding of what brand is. It's just such focus that you're choosing by, you know, with humility and curiosity, understanding your customer, understanding your own strengths, understanding the strengths that your competitors have that you could never replicate and then claiming the the place that makes the most meaning for your customers, but is also something that only you can bring. That's what's going to create the most value. So the, the short answer is if you don't do it, you're not capturing as much value as you could be. Love it. We're talking today on Sales Pipeline Radio with Lindsay Peterson. She is a brand strategist and the author of the new book, Forging an Ironclad Brand a leader's guide. You can learn more about her at the website, ironclanbrandstrategy.com. She's got a ton of great resources up there. In addition to the book, she's got a PDF of the nine criteria for an ironclad brand strategy. Good little primer for the book that you can download for free uh, off of the book. And I think, you know, before we have to take a break here, Lindsay, you have come from kind of a, what I would call as a non-MBA and not sort of traditional brand guys. You've got a very traditional man bracket. You've got, you've got an MBA. You spent time in CPG with Clorox. Um, I'm curious, as you got, went from sort of studying brand academically to managing brand in real life, what were some ahas that you found in the field, some things that changed the way you think about brand at a practical level? Yeah, I think this is the leader's kind of the paradox of being 
a general manager of being a leader is that you constantly are trying to balance short-term demands with long-term desires. And I think this sort of mm-hmm. touches on your originating question about kind of the, the false dichotomy between lead gen and brand marketing tactics. That's what's so hard about being a leader is that, uh, and this is not something that you can appreciate if you don't experience it yourself, is that you are trying to keep the lights on today. You're trying to have meet your numbers. You're trying to, to survive in the short term, but you also probably aren't doing this if you don't want to thrive in the long term as well. That's the paradox, straddling those sometimes competing needs. And it's really difficult, but it's a worthwhile nut to crack. We're going to have to take a quick break here and pay some bills. We'll be back with more with Lindsay Peterson talking about brand strategy. She specifically called this book a leader's guide. I want to find out what she means by that. And talk more about ways to combine uh, effectively your brand strategy with your demand and sales pipeline development strategy. We'll be right back. Sales Pipeline Radio. Sales teams, is your website helping you turn prospects into customers? Because Intercom thinks it should be. Intercom makes that little chat bubble in the corner of a website. That's their messenger. But it's so much more than that. The Intercom messenger is designed for businesses to jump on customer intent in the moment. It connects you when you're there or automatically books meetings and captures data on leads when you're away. You'll sell more, more efficiently. Like Intercom user Elegant Themes. They added the Intercom Messenger to their site and now convert 25% of their leads to paid subscriptions through live chat. Just having the Messenger sparked valuable customer conversations that Elegant Themes might not have had otherwise. That's Intercom's whole deal, connecting you with customers while they're on your website with timely, personal insights. Because when customers have a great experience, it's great for business, too. Help your website help you land more customers. Then see everything else Intercom can do. Go to intercom.com slash deals today. That's intercom.com slash deals. All right, back to Matt and his guest as they go bobbing for apples and more information. Before we go too far... (laughs) Uh, could you please explain to me who D. Coleman is? I'm trying, like, and I'm watching you from the <laughs> Yes, here. D. Coleman and, right here. Yeah, yeah who, is, who is D? I mean, and I may be asking a dumb question. Maybe everyone else knows who this person is. But, like, what is D. Coleman doing in your studio? Today? D. Coleman was here the other day. Uh, we do a, a show on local races here in Orange County, and he's running for San Clemente City Council against a pretty powerful right. slate of people here. Oh, my goodness. All right. Well, uh, didn't mean to get political there, but uh, go, go D. Coleman. Um, if you... The flyer looks, the, the poster looks phenomenal. There you go. So He's still, up here. Give him that. There you go. All right. All right. Well, uh, thanks for joining us again on uh, this special episode of Sales Pipeline Radio. We are digging in entirely on brand, brand strategy, ironclad brand strategy. In fact, with our guest today, Lindsay Peterson, uh, definitely check out her website, ironcladbrandstrategy.com. She's the author of the new book, Forging an Ironclad Brand, a Leader's Guide. You can find it on Amazon and all the places where fine books are sold. And Lindsay, I mean, you, you could have ended the book title with Forging an Ironclad Brand, and I'm probably already in, but then you have the tagline underneath is a leader's guide. Talk about why that angle is so important as a component of sort of your message and mission from a brand strategy standpoint. Yes, thank you. But most books about brand are written for marketing technicians. The B that I had in my bonnet is that the person or the group of people who stand the most to gain by understanding and uh, precisely defining their brand are actually the owners and the leaders of the business. Because the whole, the whole point of brand is to create sustainable differentiation so that you can be profitable for a long time. The whole point of brand is to create the most value. So the leaders are the ones who gain the most when value is maximized. That's the first reason that this is a guide for leaders. The second reason is that if the leader isn't owning and holding conviction in the brand strategy, then it simply won't be implemented. It could be a pretty um, marketing campaign, but it won't be the North Star of the company unless the leader is holding that. Because here's the thing, when you define your brand positioning, when you when you select the stake that you're going to put into the ground, you are taking off the table an infinite number of other things that you could be. And that's a really scary thing to do. 
but it's the, that's the whole power of it is in being singular, is in being really specific about your promise. So what happens if the leader does not engage in the process of defining their brand strategy is that when it gets hard to adhere to the decisions that you made, the leader will hedge. They will, mm-hmm. um, they will choose something easier. In some ways, the point to get uh, the point of brand of the brand strategy to help the leader have enable the leader to hold his or her feet to the fire for what's the focus that they've chosen. If that's delegated or if that's owned by um, an agency or by a department, by the marketing organization, it won't have the whole value because the customer experience is everything of the business, not just the messaging and not just the marketing right. tactics. So it just won't have much value. We see this a lot when you're when we're asking and we're seeing companies that want to commit to you know, a more target account approach across sales and marketing when they're asking companies to not just, you know, look at campaigns, but really create a culture change. If the top of the organization isn't bought off and if the top of the organization isn't seen as leading by example, they're really hard to see something stick. You know, I think the, the other thing that we see as a challenge, especially with earlier stage companies that are really kind of still finding their way is, is the, is the, the, the challenge between sort of agility and consistency. You know, the idea that oftentimes like strategy is choosing, right? And you talk about sort of choosing a path you want to go forward. Like a lot of companies struggle with knowing what exactly that path is. You know, they're in a new market. They're building a new brand. Um, and I know you work with some really big companies that are in leadership positions, but you've also worked with companies that are early stage companies that are, you know, in brand new categories or in brand new subcategories. So knowing what that's going to be or should be moving forward, uh, that's a risky thing. And so like, how do you counsel leaders to to have a level of confidence and and to be bold enough to choose a position and, and kind of stick with that i love this question and i think it's 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 one i'm always trying to understand better because it's kind of the uh it's another paradox of leadership is being firm while also being flexible it's kind of i feel in some ways it's like parenting like there's being really true to some ideals but not being attached to exactly how that looks in real life. I tend to do with startup founders, especially if they are anxious about making a choice, is first starting with some things like, why did you start the company? Like, why is this, why is this something that's so meaningful? Because likely there's something uh, ever everlasting in that sentiment that won't change regardless of how the company evolved and pivot. So there probably is a soul will have this kernel throughout the company. So there, there actually usually are things that the, the founders do not want to change. And that some people would call that more like mission, vision, values. It's a great place to, especially if it helps to sort of ungrip a little bit from the desire to always be able to change your mind. I bet if you really think about it, there are things that you don't want to change. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is there is no, there's nothing sacred about, uh, when you, when you select a brand promise, you're, you're selecting one that really resonates with your, the customer audience that you are trying to serve. What they need is going to change. And that's nothing to take personally. And it's nothing to celebrate if it doesn't change. It's neutral. Some markets are going to evolve and, and that, and, and it's actually incumbent on you to evolve with them. And, and it will evolve. Um, I think the tendency is for people to think that it's going to change more than it will. What's going to change is the product and the way that the customer interacts with the product, that relationship. But the underlying the human being behind this is still going to be a human being. So there's a lot that actually does remain the same. If, if it helps to stop the analysis paralysis to just start, like mm-hmm. what's our promise today, then that alone is really worthwhile. Um, there's no need to make it the sacred, you know, sacrosanct thing that you never, you never shift. It will. Um, and that's, that's healthy too. That's actually the empathetic way to lead a business as well as to know that there is going to be it's going it's going to be a dynamic process to to iterate and to refine and sometimes even to pivot 
Love it. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time. The world needs a Dollywood update here shortly. But uh, really appreciate uh, Lindsay joining us today. Lindsay Peterson, author of the new book, Forging an Ironclad Brand. Called brand Sometimes brand can feel like it gets really complicated. Like some, I've read some brand textbooks in my day that just, just get really – they're dense. They're super dense and hard to read. And what I love about Lindsay's perspective here and her book is that it, it – it, look, I mean, you can make it complicated, but some of the foundations that she's talking about, these are – these are business truths that I think for companies that lean in can be can be far more successful and sustainable. So thank you, everyone, for joining us today on another episode of Sales Pipeline Radio. If you'd like to share this episode with others on your team, you'll find it in a couple of days up at salespipelineradio.com. We will have a transcript summary of this conversation up on HeinzMarketing.com in about a week as well. And we got some awesome guests coming up the rest of October, November into the fall as we head down the closing stretch of 2019. But for today, for my great producer, Paul, my name is Matt Hines. Thanks so much for joining us on another episode of Sales Pipeline Radio. And with that, we wrap up another episode of Sales Pipeline Radio right here on the Funnel Radio channel for network listeners like you.